Even though Mewtwo was cloned from Mew's DNA, his height and body shape make him look more human-like than the original Mew. And I think that's why so many people have gotten this vibe that Mewtwo might instead be a new human hybrid. So much so that there's even a Mandela effect where people have said there was an episode of the anime that confirmed this theory, even though that never happened. But I wanted to know if there were any facts to ground these feelings. Anything to canonically prove that Mewtwo is part human. Now this is true in the Pokemon Adventures manga. Blaine, one of the scientists who created Mewtwo, uses some of his own DNA to complete Mewtwo's genome. But while the creator of Pokemon, Satoshi Tajiri, said the manga was the closest thing to how he imagined the Pokemon world to be, the manga also takes quite a few creative liberties with Pokemon lore, like making five of the eight gym leaders members of Team Rocket, and also making the Pokemon Deoxys part human as well, both of which are not at all canon. Still, I wanted something more concrete to back this theory up, and after a lot of digging through the Pokemon franchise, I found enough evidence to be convinced that Mewtwo was made with both Mew and human DNA. And I can even tell you which human character's DNA was used to help create Mewtwo. Let's start by talking about how genetic modification works in Pokemon, so we can better understand how Mewtwo was made. Even though this process is never explained in detail, there is one item from the game that gives us a massive clue. The Old Amber. This is a fossilized piece of tree resin that contains a mosquito who ate the blood of an ancient Pokemon. By taking it to the Cinnabar lab, the scientists there can extract the DNA from that blood to revive the Pokemon Aerodactyl. And if all of this is sounding familiar, it's because it's the exact same process used to revive dinosaurs in Jurassic Park. Pokemon has been using pop culture in its world building from the first games all the way to the present, so this inspiration shouldn't come as a surprise. And we know the process of making Mewtwo is similar to reviving fossil Pokemon, because the Cinnabar Lab is just a few steps away from the Pokemon Mansion, where Mewtwo was created. And the gym leader of Cinnabar Island is Blaine, that guy who helped create Mewtwo. It's an entire colony of genetic scientists, so we can safely assume that the process of genetically modifying Pokemon is at least based on the process in the Jurassic Park movies. So how does that work? Well, after getting the desired DNA, scientists fill in the gaps using the DNA of another creature. That sounds a lot like what Blaine did in the manga. This gives weight to the idea that Mewtwo being part human was an idea the manga author picked up from Game Freak rather than came up with entirely himself. But there's more. The Jurassic Park scientists then inject that modified DNA into the egg of a surrogate mother. Although this wasn't shown on screen, ostriches and emus were used to lay the first dinosaur eggs. But in Pokemon, the surrogate mother to Mewtwo was likely the original Mew. One of the journal entries in the Pokemon Mansion states that Mew gave birth to the creature they would call Mewtwo. Many people have interpreted this to be a metaphorical birth, to only imply that Mewtwo came from Mew's DNA. But this is the journal of Dr. Fuji, the lead scientist in the Mewtwo project. Even though his other journal entries use colorful language, it would be strange for a scientist to describe this process so abstractly, and frankly, incorrectly. Even the original Japanese is worded to imply the literal interpretation of Mew giving birth to Mewtwo. So what this journal entry could have originally meant was that Team Rocket already had a Mew in their possession and used it to give birth to their genetic experiment, which aligns with how the dinosaurs were created in Jurassic Park and matches how real-life cloning requires a surrogate mother to give birth to the clone. And if that's the case, gave birth is a very telling choice of words. All Pokemon, no matter the species, come from eggs. That includes legendary Pokemon. In fact, the only species we see in the world of Pokemon that give live births instead of lay eggs are humans. So Mewtwo not coming from an egg is a huge piece of evidence that he is part human. Or at least it would have been if all of this wasn't retconned. Early Pokemon was, shall we say, more extreme. The franchise hadn't found its footing yet, and many details in the earlier games and anime were altered later on. So while I think Team Rocket using a Mew to give birth to Mewtwo could have been the original intention of the first games, that idea was completely changed in the first Pokemon movie, where Dr. Fuji got Mew's DNA from a fossilized eyelash and grew the genetically modified Pokemon in a giant tank. This movie would define the canon lore of Mewtwo, with the tank showing up in future installments of the franchise, including the remakes of the original games, Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee. But a retcon doesn't mean all the original details get thrown out. When the Pokemon anime did a reboot in the Black and White series, most of Ash's backstory remained the same. A few details from his past changed, but he still had all the same Pokemon that he caught before. And because the Old Amber appears in the games after this retcon, there's a good chance that Pokemon still follows some variation of the Jurassic Park rules of genetic modification. What's more is that this retcon actually helps to strengthen this theory. The first Pokemon movie established the most canon lore of Mewtwo, so any clues from here can be taken with a lot more weight. Which brings me to this moment of the movie that always stuck out to me. Mewtwo is introduced as both the strongest Pokemon and the strongest Pokemon trainer, to which this trainer replies, a Pokemon can't be a Pokemon master. No way. 
Now, for as judgmental as that sounds, this guy has a point. Take Meowth as an example. He can talk like a human, hold and manipulate objects like a human, and is arguably the smartest member of the Team Rocket trio. He seems to have all the surface-level requirements to become a Pokémon trainer. And since Meowth himself isn't strong enough to battle, it would be a huge advantage to him and his team if he caught at least one Pokémon to battle with. But he doesn't. And this isn't for any moral reasons or loyalty to Pokémon in general. After all, Meowth is helping to steal and smuggle other Pokémon. Even the smartest and most human-like Pokémon like Alakazam are never shown being Pokémon trainers. This suggests that humans have an unspoken ability to be Pokémon trainers that other Pokémon simply don't have. But if that's the case, then how can Mewtwo become a Pokémon trainer? Well, in Jurassic Park, the dinosaurs were able to change their sex from female to male, an ability they obtained from the bullfrog DNA used to complete their genome. This is one of the biggest plot points of that movie. So if Pokémon's genetic modification process is based on this, then that means that 1. Team Rocket needed another organism's DNA to complete Mewtwo's genome, and 2 that Mewtwo would take on the traits of that organism. And based on that logic, the only explanation for how Mewtwo could become a Pokemon trainer is that he was made with human DNA, and as a result, inherited that unspoken ability that humans have to become Pokemon trainers. There's even a reason why scientists would use human DNA to create Mewtwo instead of the DNA from another Pokemon. In the Pokemon world, humans are basically super advanced Pokemon. If you go to the library in the Diamond and Pearl games, there's a book that talks about how long ago humans and Pokemon were once the same. To quote that book, it was a time when there existed no difference to distinguish the two. And there are humans that have psychic powers like Pokemon. There's the, well, psychic trainers who can levitate small objects, as well as more powerful trainers like Sabrina, who are able to make their whole bodies float. There's also a Pokedex entry talking about a child who turned into the psychic type Pokemon Kadabra. It happened one morning. A boy with extrasensory powers awoke in bed, transformed into a Kadabra. This is important because Kadabra evolves into Alakazam, who, aside from you too, was the strongest psychic-type Pokémon in the first Pokémon games. This shows that humans can have psychic powers, and occasionally turn into powerful psychic-type Pokémon. And those are traits that genetic engineers would look for if they wanted to create the world's strongest Pokémon. But that still leaves us with a big question. Which human's DNA was used to create Mewtwo? Well, we know that the first Pokemon movie contains the most established lore for Mewtwo's origins, and there's one character from that movie that stands out. Amber. Don't worry if you've watched this movie but haven't heard of her before. She's a character from the prequel short, The Birth of Mewtwo, which was added to the first Pokemon movie on later releases to provide context for why Mewtwo acts the way he does. Amber is Dr. Fuji's daughter who died at a young age, and wanting to bring his daughter back, Fuji dedicated his life to find a way to clone his child. This caught the attention of Team Rocket, who said they would fund the Doctor's research on the condition that he also make them a Pokémon superweapon. But there's something odd about how Fuji is cloning his daughter. The short establishes that to clone someone, you start by growing their body in a tank. We see Mewtwo, Bulbasaur 2, Charmander 2, and Squirtle 2 cloned in this way. But we never see the body of Amber 2. Instead, she's a ball of energy, which Fuji states is Amber's reawakened consciousness. This explains why Amber 2 has Amber 1's memories of the real world, and can remember the stories that her father told to Amber 1. The simplest explanation for why Amber doesn't have a body yet is that Dr. Fuji is still trying to perfect the cloning process, and wants to get it right before putting Amber 2's consciousness into a new body. However, this explanation has some holes in it. When looking at Amber 2's consciousness, Fuji says, Soon. While Pokemon can hatch from eggs fully grown, it still takes at least 9 months to grow a person which I wouldn't describe as soon. Unless, Amber's body is already done, and it's sitting in the tank right next to her. We know that Dr. Fuji has experienced failures in his cloning process. When the other Pokemon clones die, the scientists say, not again, and it looks like another failure. Dr. Fuji is deeply aware that all the clones, including Amber 2, have a time limit before they fade away. So what would a desperate father do in this situation to give his daughter the best chance of survival? put her consciousness into the body of the most promising experiment. I think this was Fuji's golden opportunity to kill two birds with one stone. He needed human DNA to complete Mewtwo, and Amber would have been an ideal candidate since she seems to have psychic powers herself. She's the one who initiates telepathic communication with Mewtwo, then brings along the other Pokemon clones into Mewtwo's mind. But when the scientists notice this, they only comment about how strange it is that the other Pokemon are communicating with Amber 2 and Mewtwo. They say, Mewtwo and Amber 2 seem to be communicating with the other clones. But how? They could be using telepathy. They are using telepathy. So Amber's DNA would have been perfect for bringing out Mewtwo's full psychic potential. 
And Amber being psychic also explains why it was even possible for Fuji to reawaken her consciousness. But the other big reason Dr. Fuji had to use Amber's DNA was to make Mewtwo's body more compatible with Amber's consciousness. The scientist's reaction also makes it sound like they expected Amber 2 and Mewtwo's minds to connect. When Amber is in Mewtwo's mind, she immediately starts sharing her memories with him and showing him the places that she remembers. This could be a visual representation of Amber's mind being transferred into Mewtwo's body. Mewtwo is slowly obtaining all the experiences and knowledge that made Amber who she is. That also explains why the scientist had tools to measure which consciousness was in each body. Now, it's unlikely that this was meant to be a permanent body for Amber, especially since she seems to want to coexist with Mewtwo instead of replace him. But maybe this was a way to store her consciousness in a safe place until Fuji learned how to make a more stable human body for his daughter. But the consciousness transfer goes wrong. Amber dies in the process, which causes Mewtwo to start panicking. And the scientists try to fix this problem by undoing their changes. They have to roll back Amber's consciousness transfer with a memory wiping serum, erasing any trace of Amber from Mewtwo's mind and causing the doctor to lose his daughter for good. And Mewtwo being made with Amber's DNA even works on a thematic level. According to Takeshi Shudo, the writer of both the first Pokemon movie and this short, Amber represents self-existence, which is the main goal Mewtwo needs to achieve in the movie. He was made to be a super weapon to an organization seeking power and a body to hold an obsessed doctor's lost child. He was born without a say in who he was or what he wanted to be, so he fought back against what others expected of him. And in the process, he almost fulfilled his purpose of being a super weapon on his path to rejecting it. But by the end of the movie, Mewtwo finds peace or at least a starting point for his new life, one without any predefined notions of what he should be. And this becomes a core aspect of who Mewtwo is. It's as though his journey for self-existence was baked into his very DNA. If you like this theory and want to watch more, here's two other videos you might enjoy.